Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ted Gardner, and I'm an interviewer for the Library of Congress Oral History Project here at our great public library of uh, Cincinnati. And uh, this morning, uh, we have our videographer and historian, Dennis Daly, who runs this program so well. And we have the great honor and pleasure uh, to have uh, Mr. Sievers here today. What's your first name? Leroy. Leroy. Leroy Sievers. And uh, Leroy was in the World War II Navy. I understand your father was in the World War I Navy. Right. Gee, that's, that's... He was on the battleship Maine. No kidding. Oh, my goodness. She was a famous ship. Yeah. Yeah, she was part of the old White Fleet, Great White Fleet. Right. Went around the world. Well, anyway, we have the honor of, of having Leroy Seavers here this morning. And uh, we're going to find out all about you. Where were you born, Leroy? I was born in Guilford, Indiana. Now, where is that? Uh, north of Lawrenceburg, about 12, 14 miles. Okay. All right. Very good. You and, know where the uh, ski slopes are at out there? Huh? You know where the ski slopes are at? Oh, yeah, yeah. Right above the sea, ski Perfect slopes slope. up on yeah. the hill. Right. Exactly. Okay. Um, tell us about your family. Do you have brothers and sisters? I have one sister who's uh, three years younger than I am. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have... Uh, Three children, Pam is the oldest, and then I have two boys that's a little bit younger than she is. And oh, that's... That's my granddaughter. I have another granddaughter that's in... She'll be a senior in Hanover College. This one is a school teacher. I have a, a grandson that's um, 14. Wonderful. Great family. Where did you go to uh, school? Where did you start primary? in a one-room schoolhouse at New Elsa's, Indiana. I'll be darned. And uh, the most we had in the eight grades was, I think, 18 students. Really? <laughs> That's all we, that was a top for, the, for all eight grades. For heaven's sake, my goodness. Well, things, that was, uh, you certainly knew everybody, didn't you? Oh, yeah, <laughs> very well, <laughs> very well. That's great. And then uh, after the eighth grade, what happened? I went to high school at Guilford, Indiana. Guilford. Which was a small, we had the largest graduating class that ever went out of there, and I think there were 40 some in that class. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that was it. Well, those, uh, and those days, you know, my goodness, uh, 1920s, uh, you and I both remember them well, and uh, things were so different from what they are today. The, uh, did you have any particular interests in, in uh, school? Did you have hobbies or athletics or anything like that? Went home and worked on the farm. You were a farm boy. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, you didn't have many hobbies. You, you w went home, you went to work. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> well, that, I know, and that was, uh, that was wonderful training. Wonderful training, and of course that was uh, the backbone of our nation. Right. Know, farms and the farm families and, uh, and uh, how they worked and produced and everything. Uh, okay, so let's see now. Then you finished high school, what, about 1939? That's it, 39. Okay. And uh, you stayed on the farm. No, my uncle was a road contractor and I went to work for him. Oh, you did? Yeah. Oh. In fact, I started working for him when I was 16. Wow. wow. I'd work in the summer and... Sure. Well, that's good training, too. Yeah, <laughs> construction. Tough work. Tough yeah, it was tough work. I'll say. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Well, you know, everyone has uh, uh, memories of outstanding dates in one's life. And uh, one of them, of course, is... December the 7th, 1941. Right. Where were you when you heard the news? Do you remember? Probably at home. Probably at home. Because at that time, in the winter, there was no work in construction, and I went to work for Kelly Kett over in Covington, making x-ray machines. Oh, for goodness sakes. I worked there as a machinist. Oh, I'll be 
Well, yeah. you certainly had an affinity for for machinery and, right. and technology and so right. forth. That's that's uh, that's wonderful. Well, Pearl Harbor, of course, was uh, one of the key points in a person's life who grew up in the 20th century, and. Um, What happened? Did you get a notice from Uncle Sam that no. you were? I was working at Kelly Cat, and uh, I've worked at night uh, from um, six at night to six in the morning, five days a week and a half day on Saturday. Mm -hmm. And I stayed there until probably the first part of August of 42. I went home for a weekend, and there was nobody there anymore. All the young fellows my age was gone. So I went back to work on a Monday morning, and when I left on Friday or Saturday, I said, well, I won't be back. And the guy said, well, he says, I'll draft you. I said, no, they won't, because I says, tomorrow I'm going to enlist. <laughs> so, so I went and, and enlisted. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, yeah, that was... Uh... There, there, there was a spirit uh, among the young fellows in those days, you know, to sign up and uh, serve your country. And of course the Navy, uh, all that glamorous stuff, you know, join the Navy and yeah. see the world. <laughs> we sure learned about that in a hurry, <laughs> didn't we? <laughs> well, uh, where did they send you? For I went to Great Lakes. Great Lakes, right up. North of Chicago, yeah. yeah. Great place, that's a wonderful place. How, how did you like boot camp? Well, when I went, I weighed 135 pounds, and when I come out, I weighed 150. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? Put on some pretty good weight there. <laughs> <laughs> good old Navy chow. Right, <laughs> regular hours and a lot of exercise. Yes, indeed. And you were still growing, too. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, you were, you were a fine young man. Well, um, you were there, what, what about 90 days? At, uh, yeah, I think that's what it was. Yeah, yeah. And you came out as, uh, as a seaman. Right. And tell me about your training. Then they went, when I went back after my boot camp leave, they sent me to Richmond, Virginia to school mm. for a diesel. Mm -hmm. And I come out of there, I think, as a probably a first-class fireman. Wonderful. And then from there, they sent me to uh, Miami, Florida, to Subchaser Training Center. And uh, I don't know how long I was there, but from there, I went to Key West, and that's where I caught the ship. And you, did you have any uh, Knowledge about what a sub chaser was or anything? Absolutely like none. Nothing. <laughs> no. I noticed it didn't look very big. <laughs> no. And she was wooden too. <laughs> right. The interesting thing about uh, going from uh, Miami to Key West is we went at night in a bus and you could see ships burning off the coast. Oh, yeah. And they tell me that there was more ships sunk between um, Cape Hatteras and Key West in six months than there was in the entire war with Japan. Right. Freight in. Right. Yes, the, the Germans were very, very efficient with their submarines, of course, their Untersee boats, as they called them. And, you know, there were so many crazy things that happened in the early days of the war right. because we just weren't we weren't up to snuff on well what they done they laid down um i guess there's like a channel where the gulf stream comes up right and they dropped down into there during the day and at night they would pop up and the ships would be silhouetted between them and the beach right and that's how they got so many ships that's, that's right and that's the reason the sub sub chaser went back into service for just that reason yeah, because the sub-chaser was very prominent in World War I Navy. 
Yeah, well, basically the World War II subchaser was on the hull of a World War I. Mm -hmm. And I think they built them in like 30 days. Wow. That's all it took. And they were all built by uh, small boat builders along the coast that built fishing boats. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. And they were all wood. I mean, even the ribs, the Mayflower had steel ribs, but the subchaser had wooden. And, and that's the reason that they were all built. <laughs> you could keep a submarine down. You couldn't outgun them, but you could keep them down with the depth charges. Oh, yes. You bet your life. How many depth charges would you carry on that thing? Uh, it's either 12 or 15. I really don't remember. Boy, they were deadly. Deadly armament, too. The one I was on, we had what they call mouse traps on the bow, which were like rockets and they were fired electronically and they had a about that big around about that long charge that and they had to hit something before they would explode mm -hmm. and you tipped the racks up and then they fired and once in a while if you fired them and hit a whale or something they would go off <laughs> <laughs> now you had gunnery on on that boat too didn't you when i first went aboard we had a a French 75 and 220s. Mm -hmm. And uh, we made one run to Guantanamo, and from there we went up along the coast to Norfolk. And they had a big crane that come up alongside of us and picked us right up and set us up on the pier. Mm -hmm. And they let us go home for, I don't know, a few days. It wasn't very many. When we come back, the French 75 was gone. There was a 40 millimeter put on, and there was an additional 20 millimeter. So we had the mouse traps, we had a 40 millimeter, we had three 20 millimeters, and we had the depth charges. Mm -hmm. After we went overseas, we added two more 50 caliber machine guns and two 30 calibers. No, oh, that's that's pretty good. They said we had more firepower for our size on a battleship. Yep. Yeah, I was following you there, and that, that sounded like an awful lot. I never, uh, I never saw a subchaser. I, I, I don't recall anything like that. Well, but, Christina has a picture of one if you'd like oh to see yeah, it. Oh yeah, that's a beautiful. That, yeah, that's a beautiful. Now photo. that's not our ship, but it's one with the basically type, the same thing. Type, yeah, right. Yeah, well, they were they were handsome craft. And, Good looking, yeah. Good looking ships, and and then let's see now. You told me earlier the complement of your uh, crew. twenty twenty four enlisted men and three officers. Okay. And, and at one time the the commander of the ship was an ensign. Hmm. We had three ensigns on board. How about? That? <laughs> well, but, that's that's uh, that's as low down as they can get. Yeah, that's for sure. Well, that, that's a very interesting. Uh, do you have any stories about uh, enemy, uh, seeing those enemy uh, submarines or anything like that? Not too many with submarines. We, um, some of the interesting things, when we, when we crossed the Atlantic, we refueled four different times, I think it was. Wow. And when you try to refuel something like that alongside of a big tanker when it's rough, it gets pretty rough. And we didn't have, we only had, I think, 1,200 gallons of fresh water. So we were rationed to, I think, three cups of water a day. You didn't wash, unless it was salt water, you didn't wash your clothes. And uh, you had, you never took your clothes off unless it was to change them. Mm -hmm. You slept in your blue jeans and your shirt. Uh, you took your shoes off when you slept and that was it. Always ready to go. Well, if, if if it was sunk, uh, they wanted you fully closed, and, and if one of those were hit, it didn't take long for them to sink. Right. Yeah. It took us. Uh, we went to Bermuda. The uh, civilian workers at Norfolk done such a poor job that we was taking on a lot of water, so we stopped in Bermuda, and uh, the Seabees come aboard, mm. and in about three days they solved all the problems. Yeah. 
and uh, then we went on to, uh, took us 21 days from uh, Bermuda to North Africa, and we was on convoy duty. And when we went to land in North Africa, it was actually a beachhead. And they told us, they said, now the French might shoot at you and they might not. So they shot for about four hours, then they quit shooting and quit. That was it. And uh, I, I don't know how long after we landed in Africa, but I know the first night I had shore patrol. Now why they give me shore patrol first night in Africa, I don't know. <laughs> but the captain said, take a billy club and a, and a whistle. I said, Captain, they're shooting at each other over there. I said, can't you hear them? Oh, he says, I better give you a gun then, hadn't I? So they gave me a gun. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> so I went on shore patrol. But we operated from, uh, the first place we landed was a sure shell. And then not too long after that, we hit a whale. And it stoved in the bow, bent the propellers, and we were dead in the water. That all the blood from the whale around us. And about that time, the sharks began to show up. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, this is a heck of a way to die, but I guess this is going to be it. <laughs> but there was a PC, which is a 165-foot, I think, steel boat. They come alongside, and they pushed us to the shore. And uh, they had a little trolley run out into the ocean uh, for fishing boats to repair. And... They run us up on that and they pulled us out. Now, how they done it, whether they had a winch, whether it was powered by horses or an engine, I don't know. But the Arabs repaired the bow mm -hmm. and the machinists, we beat out the propellers with sledgehammers. And we got them close enough that we could run 12 knots without vibrating and we could run 13. But if you run 12 and a half, it just shook you to pieces. And while we were in that area, we pulled into, and I think it was Oran. And they had, three or four of the crew had to put on our dress blues when we went into the harbor. And we went, why in the world would you go into the harbor and have to put you on your dress blues? We went by the cruiser, the Savannah, I think it was. And there was President Roosevelt sitting with a blanket over his lap. And Churchill was with him, and Stalin was with him, and I think de Gaulle. And of course, it didn't mean nothing to us. We just had to put on our dress blues. We didn't really want to. No, of course. <laughs> but that was our first experience of with uh, any, any big time. And how many people have you interviewed that saw those four people together? You're the first one. <laughs> <laughs> But we had, uh, oh, we, we stayed close enough to the coast and uh, we'd take on water. We'd pull in alongside of a fishing pier. Or most of them had a stone wall and we pulled in and they had fresh water. And uh, if we were out on patrol and we didn't have enough fresh water we, and we had a rainstorm, we, we would rig tarpaulins and run the water into the water tanks. Mm -hmm. I can remember going up into the mountains in Africa with garbage cans and fill them full of water and bring them back and okay. pour them in our water tanks because so? we, we couldn't make any fresh water. No. And while we was at, well, about the same time we picked up a, a man, a body that was floating and he was, a, I think, the cook on a merchant ship. And of course we got his wallet to send home and he had a real pretty red a ring with a red stone in it. And we couldn't figure out how to get that off to send it home. So you can imagine what happened. We got the ring off, but we got the finger too. And sent the, the, to home to his folks. And another time we was at Bizerti, which is right down, you could hear the guns every night, the artillery. And uh, we was at Bizerti and it was a real bad storm, and they sent one sub chaser out, 
And they come back within about an hour, they'd lost their lifeboats and everything. Hmm. All their lifelines was gone. And the minute they pulled in, they sent us back out. And the interesting part of this is, right now, we, we went out for about an hour and there was, we found a man floating in the water in a life jacket. But it was so rough that we couldn't get to him. The only boat we had was about as long as this rug and two people could ride in it, but with 12, 15 foot waves, you can't do anything. We tried to throw heaving lines to him. And after so long a time, our captain says, well, they always told me that oil would calm the waters. And we had two 50 gallon drums of oil on the stern of that sub chaser. He says, I'm gonna get upwind of that man. And he says, use knock holes in those drums and throw them overboard. And we did, and within 10 minutes, it calmed the seas enough that we picked that man up. But with another 10 minutes, and it, everything was gone. Sure. But we saved him and took him saved into the shore. Him, isn't that? That's now that's. That's a wonderful story. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of things that happened. Oh, at I this. Say, did you have uh, shore liberty? Uh, yep, there was nothing there. I remember in Bizzerti, uh Bob Hope come in there. And they went to every one of those sub chasers and, and small boats, and they had to send two men to that show because they couldn't get anybody to go to it. Uh, we were getting ready for the invasion of Sicily, mm -hmm. and all you'd done was made you more homesick when you went to something like that, we figured. So, nobody, so they made us go to Bob Hope show. <laughs> Uh, and right after that is when we made the invasion of Sicily. And Did his appearance make you feel better? No, no? not a bit, because we were mad anyhow. We had to put on our dress blues, oh, we didn't want right. to. <laughs> Darn dress blues, 13 buttons. <laughs> right. So we were getting ready for the invasion of Sicily. And uh, I don't know whether a Bizzerti, I don't know how far it is over to Sicily, but we picked up two army, and I think there were Darby's Rangers, mm. and they had uh, kayaks, but they folded up in the middle, and so they weren't very long. Oh, yeah. But we got over, and you went to, you could see Mount Et, I think it was Etna, mm -hmm. which is a volcano. Live volcano. And when you saw that, we made a left turn, and it was in daylight, I remember, and we put those two rangers in those kayaks, and the first thing they'd done, they flipped them over, went underwater and then right back up, and then they headed for the beach, and one went under the pier at Gale of Sicily, and the other one went on the point at Lacita. Hmm. Now, I don't know how many miles we might have been out, but it was, it was broad daylight, when we landed that night, we went in real close to the pier at, at Gila. And when we were right close to it, very close, it blowed up. So the man with the flashlight under there leading us in, uh, he was gone, I guess. But they reported us that we had blown up. And we were recommended for a presidential citation at that time. And <clears throat> Another interesting thing about, about Sicily after that, and you probably remember the 82nd Airborne uh, that friendly fire shot down some of the paratroopers. Yeah. Okay, we were, we were in that group that shot them down. Hmm. But what happened, they said the Navy made a mistake. Well, the Navy didn't make a mistake. I can very well remember those planes, the first wave come in and they come in with their running lights on. And it seems to me they were pulling gliders. Mm -hmm. They were very, very low. And the first wave come in, no problem. The second wave come in were German fighter bombers come in with their running lights on. Mm -hmm. And they shot up everything. So when the next wave of paratroopers come in, we shot down the paratroopers because we thought they were German planes sure. again. Oh my goodness. So that's, 
That's history that you read one thing in history, but when you stop and think of it, it wasn't really the Navy's fault. No. But you never hear that. No. no. We had a paratrooper live close to me, and he had quite an article in the paper one time about it. And I went to his house and talk, talked to him. He said, nobody ever told us that. Hmm. I said, well, I'm telling you now, it Boy, was not the Navy's you. fault. Good for you. So it, it was uh, quite interesting. And then we went on around to, uh, and I was over there when Patton slapped the soldier in, in Sicily. I remember that very well in the Stars and Stripes. The we went around to Palermo and uh, they told us, they said, now if you tie up at the pier, we get a, a bomber raid every night. So we, if you want to stay fine, if you don't want to, you go out and anchor in the bay. So our skipper chose to anchor in the bay, but that night, two sub chasers were hit at the pier mm -hmm. and burnt. And while I was in Palermo, I remember seeing uh, Marshal Tito mm -hmm. and Patton together. Good heavens, boy. And from there on, we went, uh, <laughs> this is another funny thing that happened. We, we had a small uh, yard tug towing a pontoon barge with a big gasoline tank on it. And we started up along the coast of Italy for that, for the invasion of Salerno. But we got there about the middle of the afternoon and the invasion wasn't scheduled for like that night at midnight. And while we were there, we had a submarine contact and we dropped depth charges and debris come up. Whether we hit them or not, you never know. But there was two planes come out and they must have come from Sicily or maybe from North Africa. And there was a uh, P-51 Mustang and a Spitfire and they just circled like a couple of buzzards over the top of us. All the while we were there, we were in sight of Naples and the Isle of Capri. Mm -hmm. And we were up out there with that little tug and that thing of gasoline. Mm -hmm. And when, when they would run out of fuel, they'd go back and two more would come out. Until that night when we made the beachhead. <clears throat> and uh, during the night, there was so much going on that we kept the ships were coming real close, and uh, so the skipper said, well, we're going to anchor before we get in trouble, so we anchored. But all during the night, we kept our stuff bumping the side, and we didn't know what it was, but we found out the next morning we'd anchored in a minefield. Good and, of course, the mines, I guess, on that wooden boat, unless you broke off one of those prongs, they wouldn't explode. So we took boat hooks and pushed the mines away hmm. and got out of the minefield. <laughs> but uh, that was pretty touch and go. And uh, on the on that beachhead, I remember the first. They must have been magnetic my era bombs or radio controlled because we could see them drop out of the bomb bays for the German bombers, and they'd come down so far and then they would just curve over and it hit a big ship. And one of the ships that I saw hit was the, the, uh, the seagoing tug, the Nosset. And one of my neighbors was on the Nosset. But that bomb went right down the smokestack into the, oh and an, uh, the sister ship, the Narragansett, started to push them towards the beach. And when they did, they pushed them into a mine and just broke in two and sunk immediately. Now, another thing I failed to mention, the first ducks were used in the invasion of Sicily. Oh, yeah. And the first ones they used, they kept sinking on them because they've loaded them pretty heavy and the sea would wash over the gunnels of it and they'd fill it full of water and they would sink. Hmm. And either the CBs or the Army Corps of Engineers uh, put sideboards like you would on a wagon or something about that mm -hmm. high around them and they put another bilge pump in then they could use them and that's the only reason that the ducks are being used 
later on is because they, they repaired those problems because they were going to abandon them. Yeah, and for those who don't know what a duck was, it was a D-U-K-W. Yeah. That was a, a acronym for it. Right. And uh, I never did find out exactly what all those letters meant. Underwater or something. Uh, uh, I don't know what the D stood for. I did know and I can't think of it. Yeah. But that, uh, I'm glad you mentioned that, Leroy, because <clears throat> so many people don't, uh, don't understand some of these terminologies and everything. Yeah. But that was, that was a, a brilliant uh, invention. Right. And I think, weren't they built by Higgins down in the... No, those were the landing craft. That was the landing craft. The Higgins boats was a landing craft that the ramp dropped down on yes, the bow. that's right. Now those were uh, LCVT, L right. landing craft vehicle personnel. Well, your, your uh, action there around Sicily, <laughs> that, that was pretty intense. Yeah. You guys were lucky you didn't get shot out of the water. Yeah. Well, they, they shot holes through our colors with rifles, but... Yeah. At, at Sicily, they, they said they knew that there, it was so rough when we made the landing. They knew there was something out there, but they couldn't see and tell what it was. And they had the searchlights. Uh, of course, when, they, when they'd come on, us and the rest of the ships, they would shoot them out. Mm -hmm. So that's how we... But after the invasion of Salerno, uh, I saw a lot of ships hit there. And uh, Yeah, Salerno was a very, very difficult... To... Then from there we went... We must have went back to Sicily or maybe to Africa. But then we were the first naval ship in the harbor at Naples, Italy after the city fell. Oh, you were. Mm -hmm. And you had to push debris out of the way to get to the pier to tie up. And we tied up to the pier. And I've told this many times. I said, I don't understand why a foreign boy would do it. But the second night there, I went to the opera. <laughs> in oh, Naples. Well, those Italians, they had to have their opera. <laughs> it was a big dome building, and it had glass panels in the ceiling, but the panels had all been blowed out of it, yeah. of course. Right. But, uh, right. and then I remember while, while we were in Naples, uh, we went to the Isle of Capri, which is right off the coast. And while we were there, Mount Vesuvius erupted. My goodness. Now, that was the first major eruption since it covered Pompeii. But this was a, I called it a wet eruption. I don't know what, what the terminology would be. But I tell everybody, it looked like a great big orange ice cream cone. Mm -hmm. And the lava would flow down here, and then it would flow down someplace else. And a big, most of the buildings up on that mountainside were stone. And that lava would flow around that stone for a while, and finally it would just melt, just go down to nothing, and that would be the end of it. Hmm. Now, whether there was lives lost there or not, I don't know. I don't think there were. I think the people evacuated because they had time to. Right. How far north in Italy did you get? Well, did you get to Rome? No, but I made a, made a landing in Anzio. Anzio, too. They said you've never been to hell till you've been to Anzio. Wow. Terrible. <laughs> and we made uh, the invasion on at Anzio with one main engine out and one generator out. <laughs> and uh, I'd been with, with the 82nd Airborne in Naples, and we were on Liberty, and we turned over a Jeep, and uh, I'd had my knee all messed up in my shoulder and my hip. And the skipper says, well, I'm not taking you along to Anzio. You can't do anything. I said, well, I'm going. I said, I done made three invasions. I said, I'm not going to miss this one. So he says, okay. I said, just get me up on deck when we hit the beach. And I says, I'll, I'll be okay. So 
when we got close to hitting the beach at Anzio, they helped me up on deck and I sat on a case of pet milk and manned a machine gun. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Made the Anzio beachhead. So you had a you had a machine gun to I had fire. a fifty caliber right 50 along. Caliber. And uh, I remember the first, hmm. right after we hit the beach, one of those LCVPs come alongside, and they had uh, they had a guy on board that had both legs shot off right below the hips, and they were looking for a doctor. Well, we didn't have any doctor. We never even had a medic, hmm. so we sent him on to another ship. And there was a breakwater around the harbor at at Anzio. So you went around, had to go around and come in like, like a driveway. And they had a big gun up in the mountains. They called it Anzio Annie. Mm -hmm. And it was a 24-inch gun, I think. And it had, well, a man could lay in the breech of it. And it had 90-foot barrel on it. Wow. But they couldn't lower it enough to hit the harbor. Oh, yeah. But they, right outside the breakwater. So... They'd fire about three shots and then they'd pull her back in the mountain so the Navy couldn't get the range on it. Mm -hmm. And so they'd use us for decoys. We'd zigzag and go, go in there and they'd shoot at us. And why they didn't realize it, I don't know, but then they'd pull the gun back in the mountain and then the bigger ships, the supply ships would come in. Sure. So that's just some of the funny things that happened. Oh, uh, we laid smoke in Anzio. We uh, swept for mines. We carried, uh, I don't know, maybe 10, 15 pounds of TNT in a, like a depth charge. And uh, they were using a lot of, uh, I guess you'd call them man torpedoes. They rode them just like you would ride a bicycle. Mm -hmm. And we would go out and we would throw those in the water because if a man was in the water, concussion would He'd pop up, and then that, that was the end of the torpedo. But the British had a gunboat there, well, two of them, really, the Abercrombie and the Finch. And they looked like a battleship cut in two. Mm -hmm. And they had one gun on the bow, a 24-inch gun. And they, had a, they would find a sandy bottom, shallow enough, and they would actually fill it full of water and settle on the bottom and then they'd sit there and bombard. And they could only turn, I don't know, 15 or 20 degrees either way because mm -hmm. if they fired broadside, it would turn them over. And we would patrol between them and the beach. Mm -hmm. And that's where we throw the, the little canisters over. Mm -hmm. And if I remember right, there was a hospital ship sunk off of Anzio. I may be wrong, but I think there was. Well, you saw so much action and everything, and I think it's just amazing that you, uh, uh, your only injury was when you, <laughs> when you fell right. out of the Jeep. Now, have you ever seen shrapnel? Oh, yeah. Has this man seen it? I don't think so. I got it in my pocket. I thought you were going to say you still carried it in your hip. <laughs> oh, yeah. You can show it to me. Yeah. Uh, Terrible stuff. It's at, at Salerno. Yeah. There was so much of that dropped, and it, when it hit the deck, it was red hot and it would burn. Oh, yes. So we had all those spots on that wooden deck oh, where those, <laughs> where those what? shells had hit. It's a wonder you didn't burst into flame. Well, and none of us ever was hit. We had one man got the Purple Heart because one of the smoke generators upset on him at Anzio. Hmm. It's just, just crazy. Well, you know, the same thing, of course, the terrible thing about uh, uh, our, our Air Force, our planes in the air, you know, the enemy would fire up and then the flak, right. then they'd burst. Right. And, of course, the same idea as... These the pieces yeah. that would just destroy right. anything like that. Well, well did, 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 your, did your wooden uh, boat uh, last through the war? Yeah. Well, we're just getting the good part. Oh, good. When we left Anzio, we went down through the Straits 
of Messina, mm -hmm. up along the coast of uh, Italy to Foggia or Berry, one of the two, I don't know which. And an old admiral met us there and he gave us a speech. And he says, you're going on a diplomatic mission. You're going to Yugoslavia. There was four of those sub chasers. He says, we're having problems with the German e-boats over there harassing the Yugos and you're going over. They're faster than you are, but you can outgun them. And when he got done with the speech, everybody was real happy, you know, a diplomatic mission. His last words are, you are expendable. <laughs> so we headed for Yugoslavia, and about, I don't know where we was at, but Skipper called us up on deck, and he said, uh, I need five men for a boarding party. He says, now, if we capture one of those e-boats, it goes back to the States, those five men will go back for bond drives. So he picked one officer and he picked the signalman and a, and a seaman and somebody else. And, and he says, Seavers, you go to the engine room. I said, Captain, I can't read German. I can't speak German. He says, you'll learn pretty quick. I said, well, what kind of a gun do I have? I said, I can't carry a rifle down there. He said, well, we'll give you a 38. I said, that's not big enough. I said, I want a gun that when I wave it at somebody, they're scared enough that they're not going to hurt me. So one of the officers says, I've got a 45. And he said, whenever we go out at night, he says, you come and I'll give you my 45. Mm -hmm. So we went over and we landed in hmm, where Hillary Clinton said the snipers were after her. It's a little island off the coast of Yugoslavia. Mm -hmm. But anyhow, that was our home base, and we would take commandos out, or partisans, really. And there was, I don't know how many of those, and there was two or three special service men with them all the time. We called them SS troops, but they were special service. I think they were probably the forerunners of the commandos because they could speak German. Some of them had been there over a year. And I remember one fellow, he had a rifle about as tall as he was. And I says, what kind of a gun is that? He says, I'm a sniper. I said, well, where did you learn to do that? He says, shooting squirrels in West Virginia. <laughs> so that's the type of duty we had there. And we would, another duty we had, we would go out at night and they would say, now they're gonna be they're going to be bringing a flyer back from the Palesti oil fields to this point. And you, they'll lay out there and wait. And if a flashlight flashes so many times, it'll be a friendly and they'll bring a rowboat out and you pick that man up. And you wait for two hours. If they don't bring him out, then you, you leave and you go back for three nights. And if he don't come out, then forget him. And I remember one night we was out there and we run aground. And I don't know what we hit a rock or whatever it was, but some of the crew jumped overboard and got under the bow and tried to lift it, you know, because it's underwater you can lift a lot. And we couldn't get off. And we know there was a big German gun emplacement up on the side of the mountain. So all the whole crew got on the stern and hung out over the fan tail mm -hmm. and bounced it up and down. And the skipper was up on the bridge. We got it bouncing real good. He gave it full speed of stern and we backed off of that. Mm -hmm. But it was, they said if the Germans caught you with a knife that they'd use it on you. So we all got rid of our knives <laughs> while we was on that rock, but we got off of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember another night that the uh, and I don't remember, something to do with Mountbatten. But the Scottish went ashore playing the bagpipes on one of these islands. They would go out every night, and there must be a thousand islands along the coast of Yugoslavia. Mm -hmm. 
But we was out one night and, and they said, now there's nothing out there tonight. Anything you see moves, shoot it. So we were sitting out there waiting and a German E-boat was about the size of a PT boat. Right. Uh, but they didn't have the 40 millimeter like we did. So they, they carried torpedoes. You're right, they, they carried yeah. torpedoes, but they didn't need them over there. Right. But we saw this thing on radar and they tried to radio it and there was nothing and they tried to signal it with the lights, there was nothing. So we opened fire and sunk it and it was a, and that's when I had the gun on and my knees was a knocking because mm -hmm. I was going to have to go aboard. <laughs> <laughs> I was scared. So it was a, it was a, a Hugo coastal freighter is mm -hmm. what it was. But I don't think we killed anybody. I, I, I really don't know anymore. Mm -hmm. But another time when we were, we, we would go back about once a week to Italy and, and take on fuel and water. Well, we probably got water over there, but no fuel. But uh, I had the wheel watch and we was heading back for just as calm like this floor. And the captain was up on the flying bridge and we had a voice tube from the, from the wheel. And I says, Captain, there's a plane crash dead ahead. He said, we didn't see it. I said, one did, I just saw it. Mm -hmm. And about that time, he says, full speed ahead. And we got up there. There was a B-17 laying in the water. And the whole crew was out on the, on the, on the wings. And we got them all picked up <laughs> before that plane sunk. I don't know how long it took it to sink. I don't remember. It wasn't very long. But they were mad. Boy, they were mad. And one of the rest of the men in the squadron, they called him Shardy. They said, Shardy shot us down. And whenever the bombers went out, they test fired their guns. And Shardy was test firing his gun, but he shot them down. Mm -hmm. So it was shot down by one of their own, one of their own group. Yeah, yeah recognition was, uh, was a very dicey thing. Some men were well trained for recognition. Others were trigger happy. Oh them. yeah. And uh, well now, as you worked your way up, uh, now did you get into the Pacific? No. You never got into the Pacific? No. That's interesting because uh, I never got into the uh, Atlantic or, mm -hmm. or the Mediterranean. <clears throat> well, after we left Yugoslavia, well, the first uh, group that we took out and they pulled a raid, they come back and they had a casualty. Well, a, a wounded, I should say. And it was a woman. Hmm. We had no idea that it was a woman when they went out. They carried, they carried a, a rifle, a sidearm, a stiletto, hmm. two bandoliers of ammunition, and uh, six hand grenades. That's when they hit the beach. That's how they went. Wow. And they would, there wasn't enough room on there, so when we took them out at night, they would lay in our bunks. When we brought them back, well, they'd, they'd lay in the bunk till they got, this was the name of that island. And uh, after they got off one night, I crawled my bunk, laid down, and there was a lump in there. There was a hand grenade in my, <laughs> in my bunk. <laughs> <clears throat> now, I told you we were recommended for the unit citation. You're right. Okay, when the skipper when we were in Naples, the skipper was called to the Savannah. And the old admiral in charge was the one that had recommended us for the unit citation. But he wasn't available that time. And I've found out since that he'd committed suicide. Oh my word. Now he was the commander of the, remember when they had the, uh, mock landing in England before the Normandy beachhead yeah. and, and the Germans got in and sunk some. He was in charge of that mm. and he dwelled on it so bad that he finally committed suicide. Got to him. Yeah. So that's where my unit citation went. There it went, yep. But after we left <clears throat> Yugoslavia, we went down through the 
uh, Straits of Messina, back up along the coast. Then we was in on the, uh, the uh, surrender of the island of Corsica. Mm. In the, I can remember the capital of Corsica is a Jackie O. Yeah. And they told us when we went in, they said, now, we don't think there'll be any fire, but there might be. So we had a man or guns when we went in. Mm. And I remember that must have been the state house or whatever it was up on top of the hill or the mountain. And the captain had to go up there. Now, he must have accepted the surrender of the island. Mm. But from there on, we went and made an invasion into southern France. Oh, you got into southern France. <laughs> My word. So that was, that was uh, June, July of 1944. Yeah. Southern France. And you know that the unit, that the uh, our great uh, light cruiser, the USS Cincinnati, she got her battle star in the invasion of southern France. Oh, is that right? Yes, sir. And right down here in the library, right down in the atrium, when when you have some time, you go in there and you'll see silverware that was aboard this ship, and. Uh, Quite a nice display of, you know, of uh, uh, USS Cincinnati memorabilia, and uh, she she really had um, you know very interesting time. Well, now with, we're, we're we're running a little short here, and I want to find out about um, how long were you over there? Went over in '43 and come back in. Sometime in 44. Mm -hmm. About a year anyway. Huh? But they give the ship to the French yes. uh, right after the invasion of southern France. Yep. And half the crew got shipped back to the States. And a week or two later, the other half the crew was shipped back. Mm -hmm. But that's about the end of my combat. <laughs> <laughs> well, you had some real combat. I very exciting and uh, and uh, now as a motor machinist uh, you were below decks a lot weren't you right but on the small boats the motor machinist we stood a watch in the engine room we stood a wheel watch we stood radar we stood sound gear and we st stood lookout oh golly so you got a lot of topside oh yeah exposure we we could we could land that thing tied up to the pier or anything. Sure, you knew that. Now, the, the deckhands didn't get that because they didn't go in the engine room. That's right, of course. Huh. While we was in, <clears throat> in Bizzardi, <clears throat> we went out and we were supposed to take a convoy to Bombay, India. And we were out about a day, I guess. We were real, getting real close to the Suez Canal. And I had engine room watch and one of the engines blowed up. And they said, I'd just come out of there like a shot out of a cannon. Oh, <laughs> just, just as white as a sheet. Oh my goodness. And the skipper says, how much did it get hurt? And I, I'm not gonna say what I told him, <laughs> but I went back down and those big engines, they were 500 horse GMs. Mm -hmm. And they had a habit of when they got war so bad, they would explode in the crankcase. Oh. And they had little explosion plugs on it, blowed them open. And then it would kick the engine back to idle. So all I had to do was kick it into right. gear and then it went on. But that was about my career. If we're out of time, we're out of time. <laughs> well, uh, I want to uh, uh, taper off here. Uh, uh, so you, uh, then you had your orders. Did you come back on, on the SC? No, no, it was given to the French right after oh, the invasion. it was given invasion. to the French. I come back on a Liberty ship. You came back on a Liberty ship, I'll be darned. You came back into New York? Yeah. Isn't that something? Uh, I, I, I think that's just, just outstanding, Leroy. And um, what, uh, what rate did you have when you finally got out? I was a second class motor Second back. class? Yeah. Boy, that's, that's excellent. Just absolutely wonderful. Well, with your, I can see with your uh, proclivity for machinery and everything. You were the right man in the right place. Yeah. 
And then you got all that, that gunnery too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we broke down in, in Bizzerti. And I told the captain, I said, I know just what we need. It's over in an aircraft hangar over there. And he said, well, go get it. So I went over to the aircraft hangar. It was a piece of cable for the throttles or something. And I got it, brought it back, put it on, and away we went. <laughs> we had a terrible time with supplies because we had to get a lot of them from the Army. If we run out of food, we had K rations. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Another interesting thing, <clears throat> we had all of our food stored up on top side. And when it got wet, all the labels would come off of it. <laughs> So if the cook went up and got a can of this and that, you may have nothing but green beans or you may have nothing but potatoes. And that's when they started stamping in the top of a can. If it was mm -hmm. green beans, it was GB, or if it was potatoes, it was a P, or if it was mm -hmm. beef, it was whatever. But they stamped them in the, in the metal of the can. So you didn't have to worry, then you knowed what was in there. So there's a lot of things that they learn oh, by I experience. Should, I should say. Sometimes we'd get mail uh, once a week. Sometimes it would be once a month. Yep. But they always had money for payday. Mm -hmm. We always got our money. Yep. But we'd have to go ashore and, and get stores from the Army a lot of times, most of the time, really. Because the big ships didn't want to give any, any stores to those little guys. Yep. They didn't, they, they forgot that you was doing all the dirty work for them. That's right, that's right. Well, the, uh, there, was, there was something special about the Navy though, I'm telling you, that, that was just different from anybody else, of course, and uh, it built a, uh, built a spirit right. in the men that served. And uh, Leroy, you came back to the States Came back to Guilford, Indiana? No, I went to, uh, <clears throat> went to Boston and, and they sent me back to the hospital in Melville, Rhode Island, I think it was, right out of Portsmouth. Mm -hmm. And I was in the hospital for a couple of months with that leg. Oh. And they finally sent me back to Great Lake, or to Chicago, unfit for further combat, mm -hmm. limited duty. So they give you the choice of the nearest naval station to your home. So I was sent to uh, Crane Naval Ammunition Depot at Crane, Indiana, I guess it was. Mm. And I was there for a short time and then they said, you're either fit for full combat or discharge. So I went from, great, uh, from there to Chicago for discharge, and uh, I don't remember how long I was up there, mm -hmm. but I know they said, if you want to discharge right now, we'll give it to you. If you want a medical, you'll have to wait three days. I said, well, it's been three years, I might as well wait three more days. Sure. So I actually come out with a medical discharge. Good for you. But I was, I was discharged at two o'clock in the afternoon and I was in downtown Chicago at State and Madison eating a big steak and Japan surrendered. So I was out of the Navy for three hours <laughs> and Japan <laughs> surrendered. And then I come home, went to work. Japs thought, well, we might as well give up. <laughs> Seavers is out. <laughs> yeah. Well, so. congratulations. Your service has been absolutely outstanding and you tell the story so well. I love the way you express yourself and I know that your family is going to enjoy this DVD that you get from the interview. That'll come in, in, in a couple of weeks or so. But um, uh, it's, uh, we thank you for your, your wonderful service, your expression and so forth and uh, God bless you. Maybe I talk too much. No, you don't. Nope. <laughs> No, I'm sure we could go another hour. <laughs>